with my colleagues in spiritual psychology, I spent a lot of time talking about the conflict of how do I come out and let people know this is what I'm doing? How will it be received? You know, how much of it should I share? Will I lose my job if I do this? Fear stops us from achieving our true greatness. Are you a professional woman who is feeling stuck, unmotivated, or burned out? Are you worried about your wellness? Are you letting fear stop you from crushing your goals? If you answered yes to any or all of these, then this is the podcast for you. Dr. Charmaine Gregory, Night Shift Emergency Physician, Burnout Thriver, and Wellness Champion, along with everyday heroes just like you, will explore how to face fear in our lives and emerge victoriously. Hey, thanks for checking out this episode. Be sure to click the subscribe button and the notification bell so you get notified when the next video comes out. It only takes two seconds to make two clicks. So let's do it. Let's get back to the video. Hello, 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 Fearless Freedom family. This is Dr. G and we are here this week with Dr. Leroy and she is going to tell you all about herself, what she's up to because it's a lot. So take it away, Dr. Leroy. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for having me here with you today. My name is Dr. Andre Leroy. I am both a Harvard-trained medical doctor and a medical intuitive, and I support people in enhancing their vitality so that they can basically live the life of their dreams and thrive. I also help physicians who want to pivot into wellness careers so that they can really live life on their own terms. Awesome. So now you have to uh, dig a little deeper and tell us how you got onto that journey because that's really what we want to know. Like, how did you get there? Like, how did you get to be in a the position where you're able to help others the way that you do? Yes. I mean, it's, I would say it starts from childhood. So my mother is Jamaican. My father is Haitian. Big up Jamaica. Big up Haiti. (laughs) (laughs) We, uh, I grew up in a household on my dad's side. There are now 14 physicians on my mom's, all natural healers. And we grew up using both, you know, sometimes when it got to too serious and we needed to, we would go see one of my cousins who's an internist who lived down the street from us. I grew up in Chicago Um, or other times, uh, you know, at the beginning phases, I would talk to my grandma who would make what we call bush tea. Of course. Yeah, yeah. She would brew it for us and, and you would feel better. So I grew up in this household, never understanding how one would conflict with another. Right, right. And then when I got into medical school and training, it's like, oh, all well, this stuff is terrible, it's bad, but we know everybody's using it, everybody's doing it. And to me, it's more about the outcome. It's more about how does it make you feel? Are you feeling more energized, more vital? Because a lot of the treatments that we are traditionally giving people at times make them feel worse. And so then they turn to these things to supplement and support themselves. And so I always thought, why can't I be a bridge? And in my own journey, you know, I went through several phases of burnout throughout my career. And I feel like stress management was taught as an experiential course in medical school. (laughs) All learned it very, very well. However, what's on the other side of that. And so I really wanted to create a new possibility to be able to still do what I love. I love serving people. I love sitting me to be with them. I love supporting them and optimizing their health. And can I also do it in a way that doesn't drain me? That doesn't take away from my energy, but uplifts me and creates a win-win situation for all. And so that's when I started my uh, practice. And I also, because I, on my mother's side, a lot of the healing is very intuitive. And you're like, intuitive, what does that mean? Just means 
being able to understand or um, experience something or have a wisdom of something without any logical reasoning behind it. So we all have intuition. Uh, we haven't been conditioned societally to utilize it as much. Um, I think more and more it's becoming more acceptable. But if you look at the greats in medicine, Hippocrates, Maimonides, they talked about being able to sit and be being still and quiet and listening in for the answers of how they wanted to treat people. And medicine for me is both a science, but also an art. And I feel like in the era of evidence-based medicine, which is so important, we lost sight of the art. And so I want to bring that art back so that we're upholding both sides of the, of the picture here. So. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Because like, um, you know, it's, it's funny because I was talking to uh, somebody the other day and we were talking about this very same thing in the sense that, you know, medicine has really shifted to the far extreme of just the, just the facts, just the facts, just the facts. And then the, um, the human component kind of gets left to the wayside. So you, 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 don't, you don't actually get to implement the art of medicine. And that is the difference between, um, you know, Googling something, <laughs> utilizing that information completely out of context without any training whatsoever. And then, you know, going forward or having the person who actually has had the experience and has the human factor that can actually, that can actually implement the art side. So, you know, we do feel, particularly as um, allopathic physicians, a lot of times you kind of, you're trained in a way that it is, is just this particular thing. It's like cause, effect, treat. Yes. You don't always have that um, additional insight where you can implement the art. And so what you find is that over your years, so I'm still a baby doctor, right? I guess I say my, I call myself a baby doctor still because I've been doing it for 16 years, right? So, you know, so at 16 years, I would say that I have started to figure out the art side. You start to figure out how you can engage your patients in a way that they're going to trust you because in my job, I have to have them trust me like immediately because I don't have a whole lot of time with them. They don't know me from Adam and they're seeing me on the worst day of their life. So it's like the trifecta of like things working against <laughs> trust. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I have, I have literally had to master art early as I am implementing facts. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and you know, it's 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 definitely it's definitely a skill set that is not you know, it's not bestowed upon you when you're in your training. It is something that is dependent somewhat on your personality and your willingness to stay within the confines of the structure but still be cognizant of what the needs are of the person at the other end right which is not something that is super easy to do and is not common like it's not <laughs> i'm trying to say this like really euphemistically um but anyway so yes the art does come through um for many of us i would not say that it comes through for all of us and i do see where there is a need for the integration of the two worlds, which is what it sounds like you're adept at. And, you know, I find it fascinating that you had that history where you had the two sides of the coin within your own family. And, you know, that you had the influence from early ages. And so, but there had to be when you made the decision. So you went to Harvard, you know, you did the, you did the traditional route, right? And so I'm sure when you made a decision that you were going to start to integrate things, that there had to be some fear associated with that. Can we talk about it? Paralysis, as a matter of fact. My colleagues are going to laugh at me. 
They're going to look down upon me. They're going to poo-poo upon this. They're going to be like, what a quack. What's happened to her? Is she crazy? Is she insane? And I think it took me, I decided to get additional training. I got a master's in spiritual psychology. And this opened the window because there I got a lot of training on how to enhance the skills that we all have. We're just not necessarily as conscious of them or aware of them, but there is complete capability to develop these skills. And so it took me on this journey and it was a distance uh, program. So I would fly out to Los Angeles every month from Boston. And then slowly but surely, I started incorporating some of this into my work, but I had to talk about it a lot with my colleagues in spiritual psychology, I spent a lot of time talking about the conflict of how do I come out and let people know this is what I'm doing? How will it be received? You know, how much of it should I share? Will I lose my job if I do this? So it was a real uh, scary time, but then I realized there were so many other people like me, maybe not hadn't done as much training, but had the same yearning, the same wish, the same, you know, desire, because we all want to do what's best and what's right. And if we can do it in a way where it's collaborative, instead of a uh, tension or struggle between you and the, in your patient, it being a dance, it just makes all the difference in the world and can have a tremendous impact, not only on them, but it energizes you. Because mm-hmm. yeah. then you're actually doing what you signed up for, right? Which is actually helping people. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> but it, you know, it requires a little letting go. You know, it, ha- it, yeah. it requires a little letting go of the control of like, mm. this is what we absolutely have to do and are going to do for this particular situation it might require a a little bit of uh, alliance building, a little bit of connection, a little bit of, you know, how can I see what, how this person is receiving the experience that they're going through while they're going through this? Like, I even ask people all the time, well, what is your biggest fear as it relates to whatever issue they're experiencing? And it could be totally different than what I think it is. You know, it could be, I, for example, I had a stroke patient and, um, you know, we were in rehab and he was getting stronger and better. And I was all excited and, and I was like, and, but he was just hesitant. He was appreciative that things were coming along, but I asked him, what is your biggest fear? He's like, what if I'm never able to, you guys have me on these meds and since I've been on them, I have not been able to have an erection. So that's huge. That's huge though. He's like, yes, am I going to go home and never be able to make love to my wife again? And so here it is. I I was thinking, Oh, he's getting stronger. We're moving along. We got this going and he had completely different concern that had I not done a little bit of exploring mm-hmm. that it it actually was a simple fix we talked to the neurologist we talked to internal medicine like okay can we get him off is there something we can use other than the metoprolol right and, you know given his condition which is like a medicine for you know rate control and blood pressure control and we were like absolutely there's plenty of other options and so we made that small little shift and he took off. He was that is like great. a person. Yeah. And so you just See, never- so, that's, so that's pretty neat. Yeah, you're right. I mean, because that's neat though, because you you specifically asked him what is the thing that he fears, which is, you know, we we tend not to ask that question because we come to the conclusion ourselves about what we think the patient should should fear yeah. <laughs> or feel. Oh my gosh, that is right up there with um, uh, talking back, which is when you uh, tell them something and then you're like, well, or teaching back, it's called. And then you tell them, why don't you teach me back what I just taught you? 
And if they fumble and bumble, then you know that you have to start all over again. <laughs> if yeah. they are like, oh, this is what I thought you said. And you're like, oh, thank you. That helps you to have a moment where you can correct the wrong before it gets too, too late. <laughs> it gets too yeah. large. Um, so yeah, no, that's great. I love it. I love that you asked, what is your fear? I love that. I might have to start using that on <laughs> some of my patients. Or sometimes I ask, what is your biggest wish? What do you mm. wish for this? You know? And, you know, for some people like you, emergency medicine, the wish might be, you know, I don't want to die. Am I dying? You know, because they don't know. They don't have the necessarily the same knowledge as we do. And just being able to relax into that question sometimes can really support people. And so if you can give them that either clarity, like, yes, this situation is yes. touch and go. Or, yeah. Yeah. you know what? We're not there. Right. Let's take a step back. <laughs> Let's slow this down. Here's what we plan to do. Because oftentimes they can't even receive what you're no. hearing and yeah. what you're asking of them. Mm -hmm. If they're in such a state of fear, shock, anxiety, trauma, they're not able to receive any of the information that you want to deliver. So true. Oh my gosh. And you know, I, I find, and I've been doing this more and more lately. Um, I don't know if it's a function of the current practice environment that I'm in, or is this a function of me, you know, entering into that later stage of baby doctorhood? I don't know. Uh, but anyway, I tried my best to use levity, right? So I will, uh, I'll make a joke. So like, if they say, am I going to die today? And I know it's not anything serious. I'll be like, well, we're all going to die, but your time is not today. And I'll just make a joke about it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, unless you have other plans, you have other plans, tell me because I need to know, <laughs> you know, and just to, just to ease the moment, because I find that people have gone on Google, right? And they have, they have taken things out of context and they have these preconcept, preconceptions that, you know, things are a lot worse than they actually are. And or the opposite is true. They've completely diminished what it could be. And then they come to me when things are in a pretty bad way. So you have both sides of the coin. But I find that the thing that they say is the problem is usually not the problem. And it's not until you like loosen up a little bit and you maybe tell a joke or something, or you ask them about something that makes them happy or whatever it is, something to distract them and to ease their mind. That's when you get the real reason why they're there. And I mean, this, people may wonder how is this even possible in the emergency department? But even when I was in the really, really busy emergency department, I still was able to do this because I would use I would use those first few moments when I enter the room. I would literally say, you know, hi, I'm Dr. Gregory. I'm going to take care of you today. Um, tell me how you're doing. And I just let them talk. And you just let them talk for a good minute, you know, sometimes even more. And I mean, of course, I'm not going to let them go like, well, you know, back in 1975 when I was born, this is what happened to me. I'm not going to let them do that. But just having them talk and just actively listening for the first couple of minutes just makes a big difference because now it's like, you just think about it. Like if somebody's listening to what you're saying, you feel important. You feel like the person is actually interested in your well-being. And so that is huge because they tend to tell you really what's going on once they feel at ease. And for me, I have to make that happen in a record time record time i don't have like multiple visits to like hash yeah. through things i literally have minutes <laughs> so yeah. and so one of the skills i teach people actually is in addition this is great like the act of listening it's so important because when people feel like they're being heard they feel loved yes and who better to feel loved from by your you know healthcare team um, but the other thing that I really work on with people is, can you read a room? Are you able to walk into a room and sense, like, what does it, what do you see? What does it feel like? Is there tension there? And these aren't skills that are necessarily measurable, 
so to speak, in the uh, traditional sense, but they're definitely something that over time, if you work at, you can get better and better, and it's like a refining that occurs, and it just makes the experience so much richer. You know, I sometimes have to sit in on family meetings where the prognosis isn't so great, and people are grappling with major decisions about what to do or how to move forward. And sometimes just being able to read the room, you can get a sense of like, are they even ready in this conversation to make a decision? Are they just here to receive information? Is there angst between family members and that angst is getting in the way of them being able to reach a consensus about what to do? And these are all skills that we have. It's just a matter of, can we pay more attention and can we enhance them and elevate them to deepen the experience? No, absolutely. And that goes, that speaks to the art of medicine, right? I mean, that's all of that that you're describing is art. So, you know, not really, I mean, I don't know, because I went to medical school a really long time ago, but, you know, um, I'm assuming that there are some softer skills that are being taught. I know they try to do it a little bit in residency, but it's, you know, obviously I understand why I understand because it's a lot of content that needs to be internalized over a, a finite amount of time. And you need to make sure people are proficient in order for them to be able to go out on their own. I get it. But I would hope that we as a, as a field, would be thinking about how we can utilize these things, particularly if we are in people facing specialties, right? I mean, I get it. If you don't have to see a patient, then, you know, maybe this is not, uh, you, you probably have to work more on like your communication with colleague thing, but not necessarily, you know, getting info from the patient, reading the room, that type of thing. Um, but, you know, it, it's kind of like one of those things that you would hope that we would collectively strive for. We'd hope <laughs> we could do that. Cause, because it's not, it's not a, it's not like, it's not intuitive, right? Well, maybe it is, but you know, it's, it's, you have to, you have to tap into that, right? So if it, even if it is intuitive, you have to tap into that. And so if yeah. you're not open to tap into that, it's not going to happen. Right. And so it's almost like we, have to be open enough to seek it out, to be better in that way, to embrace the art of medicine so that we can take better care of our patients, you know, because we already have the facts, right? We, we did the things to get the facts, but the implementation is where the art comes into play. Yes. And it carries over beyond just the bedside. It carries mm -hmm. over to your relationship with your spouse, your relationships with your friends, how your colleagues see you. How every, you know, it's, it's interesting once I opened up to this experience, how many people come to me and they want to talk to me about what's going on with them because they feel heard and we all want that or they're dealing with their own burnout and they're trying to figure out like, how do I get to the other side of this? How can I see this situation differently? What is the opportunity for me to grow through what I'm going through? And so it's just taken me on a, a much deeper journey into introspection. Nice. I think in order to really uh, soar in this area, you want to be able to work on yourself and grow. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, it's Dr. G. And I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank you for listening to this episode. I'm so honored to have you here with me. Did you know that I can help you to get your own podcast started? With my podcasting launch course for professionals, I walk you through everything you need to know about starting a podcast. I'm with you every step of the way from sign up to launching your show with five episodes ready to go. There's a done for you version that's also available. If you would just rather just do recordings and leave the behind the scenes work up to us, then that one is definitely for you. But either way, we've got your back here at Fearless Freedom with Dr. G. Oh, if you already have a show, 
and you need production services, we have monthly plans available for you. So check out the links in the episode show notes for more information. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, no, that's that's totally paramount because, you know, it's uh, and it's it's interesting that you mentioned burnout because um, I was telling I was um, I was on uh, uh, Dr. Sheree's podcast the other day. And, well, it hasn't been released yet, but we just did the recording. And one of the things that she was asking me was basically, you know, like, how could I do things that I how could I, how could I do things without really thinking too much about it? Like. How can you just sell everything and just move 7,000 miles away with your family? Like, how do you do that? And I was like, it's because, I mean, it started with me um, recognizing that I needed to change something in my life. And at the time, it was my physical self. And it turned out that it was actually the fact that I was going through burnout. <laughs> so like as in the process of things, you know, um, as I was doing physical exercise and also starting to work on personal development on a regular basis, then it became very clear that the the patterns of my my rituals before work were definitely alarming and not normal and were signs of burnout. And so, you know, it's like you mentioned that you know burnout led you down this path of introspection and intuitive uh, practice and it's interesting because burnout has a funny way of doing that you know if you recognize it now for me i didn't recognize it i actually like serendipitous serendipitously kind of fell into it and started to see see it for what it was after i worked on something else in my character so, you know, the fact is that if we are not being introspective, if we're not working on our personal selves, we A, will not recognize when we are starting to go down into the pit. We B, will not understand that we need to have multi dimensions to ourselves and not just have it be one dimension, which is medicine, right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people, that's all they have, right? All they have is medicine. And it's fantastic, but it's not fantastic because nobody wants you as the caregiver to be broken. <laughs> nobody wants that <laughs> because if you're broken, guess what? Yes, your skill set is a last to go, right? It's kind of like um, alcoholism or um, drug abuse, right? You, you function, function, function very well until the very last moment when you fall off the precipice and you stop functioning. Nobody wants that for you. And so it behooves you to start, even if you feel like you're not there, just start doing a little bit of personal development on a regular basis. Maybe start three times a week and then build up to daily. And it doesn't have to be anything complicated. It could be literally affirmations. It could be literally listening to something inspirational. It could be literally, you know, listening to a podcast or reading something or audiobook or something like that. It doesn't have to be complicated, but I am telling you, it is important. It is so important. It's not even funny. <laughs> it's essential. It's not just important. Yes. It's, it's, it's essential. And when I coach, you know, healthcare practitioners, I tell them this too. It's like, yes, we're spending an hour together and we're hashing through some things that'll bring up the awareness and help with the little shifts, but it's what you do outside of here that's going to make the biggest difference. Like, are you visioning for your life? Because I imagine, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but perhaps intuition also supported you in getting to Guam. Like maybe you didn't necessarily have it all mapped out and planned out like step A, go here, do this, and then I'm going to go here. But you kind of allowed yourself to open up to these possibilities on this winding path. And that is your inner wisdom. That is your intuition. That is your heart guiding you to the next step. Yeah, it's, it's, it, no, you're right. Absolutely. Like I, um, she asked me, was I not afraid? I was like, yeah, I was afraid. I mean, I'm afraid and everything, but I'm not going to not let my fear not make me do the thing. Yeah. You know, I, I learned that 
every time and again the caveat is always as long as the fear that you have is not going to be protecting you physically right <laughs> i mean i'm not gonna jump off a cliff without a parachute or whatever you know that's what i mean like when i say physical harm but you know if the fear is something like i had an incredible fear of public speaking i still have it but it is so like is such a like a, a fuel for my speaking now when before it was like this ridiculous ridiculous amount of angst and like a sympathetic overload that would happen and all these ridiculous replays in my head that were not positive and that took away from the energy and the output to the audience and so once i recognized that I started myself on a desensitization pathway where I got in front of more audiences. I did like Facebook lives and IG lives. I just did more extemporaneous speaking. And then I did the podcast, right? Started this podcast. So, you know, it's, it's not a matter of like, are you scared? Yes, of course, you're going to have fear. But it's, you know, fear is like a potential energy. And I say this quite a bit. It's a potential energy. And it's like, the cheetah who's waiting, right? A cheetah, you know, the cheetah has like amazing musculature and has the capability of achieving incredible speeds. But when the cheetah is waiting, all of that potential energy is in her sinews and her bones and her musculature. But when she's re when she sees her target and she's ready to hunt and she goes off, that becomes kinetic energy. So the fear is potential energy before you do the thing. If you stop there, then, oh my gosh, you'll never get where you need to go. You'll never grow where you need to go. And so if you push forward and you turn that fear into kinetic energy, oh my gosh, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible what happens. Like I look at myself um, eight years ago, eight, nine years ago, I guess it was nine years ago. And the person that I was nine years ago is completely different from the person that I am now. And so making a decision that is a big decision like that, you know, oh, we decided in October, let's just, let's just go somewhere. We picked the place in a day. I interviewed, I got the job. Then we had to do all the things. We had to sell the houses, sell the cars, get the licenses, all the things. But I was like, whatever, it'll happen. Like I wasn't afraid of that because I knew that whenever you start to feel those butterflies in your stomach and you know this is not something that's going to cause you bodily harm that's your trigger to go yes do it right because that's your litmus test that says this thing right here is going to be big and i have no regrets i have no regrets i have no regrets about selling everything and moving seven thousand miles away zero regrets actually my life is so much more enhanced at this point than it was when I was in my wow. previous place. And that would never, ever have happened if I hadn't decided to take that potential energy and turn into kinetic energy and just do it anyway, even if I'm afraid. Yes, and so the way I frame it is we're taking that fear and we're turning it into excitement. Yes, yes. Because when you can shift it from that, you know, that tension and that inaction and that stagnant energy, like you said, into that active movement. It's like, I'm sure over time it became more and more exciting. Like, oh my gosh, here we are. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Island. And oh, I yeah. see your posts. I'm like, Whoa. oh my gosh, it is so, it's so awesome. Ooh. It's so awesome here. <laughs> I can't like even, that. I can't even explain it. I like, I try, but it's like, I don't even have the words and I have a decent vocabulary. I just don't have the words to describe it. It is, it is uh, incredible. It is, really is incredible. And especially going, you know, I'm, um, you know, thinking about winter. Like you don't have to think about that really, do you? No. no. And I used to think about winter a lot because I lived in Michigan, right? Which, you know, winter gets pretty crazy. And then I, for medical school, I was in Buffalo, which, you know, like yeah. there was just a ton of snow all the time. And I didn't realize it, but I actually had seasonal affective disorder. I, I thought it was kind of weird that whenever we'd go skiing, I felt better, you know, like 
I would feel kind of bad and then I'd feel better whenever we went skiing just because the sun was reflecting off the snow. And then I went to, you know, when I went to residency someplace warm, so it was like not a big deal again. And then of course I went to some, I settled out in someplace cold and then it became very evident. But as soon as I figured it out, I literally every January, February, March, we were out of there. Like mm-hmm. end of December, we always had a trip every single month to, to get to sun. Like we knew, like we had to, in order to make it through living in someplace cold. And so it is very different, right? But I'm an island girl, you know? So it's like, this is a homecoming <laughs> to be yeah, in an island. Yeah. Yeah. And so, the yeah. You felt, even oh, yes. The butterflies you felt in there. So the, that is your gut instinct. That is your intuition telling you that, yes, keep moving in this direction. Keep moving that way. This is, this is where we want to go. And so it's just so incredible how you followed that all the way to Guam, you know? <laughs> I, I guess it is, I guess it is not really like a normal thing. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know for us. It's kind of like, all right. Cause even my, my whole family was like, yeah, let's just face the fear together, mom. Like they all are, because I guess they've seen my process. Like they've seen like what has happened to me over the years and how I have took a fear and just went after it. And, you know, then the next one and the next one and the next one. And they've seen what happens when you do that. And they themselves have done the same. Like, you know, my children have, you know, had some fears and they've had to overcome them. And, you know, they did so very constructively. And so when the time came for us to be on this big adventure, they were ready, you know, (laughs) they were like, yeah, let's do it. As opposed to some people who the fear comes up and then they may turn to control. Yes. How do I control my environment so that I can dampen this fear, you know, so I can suppress it so I don't have to experience it. So they'll do everything to create a life so that they can avoid it. But the truth is the only way around something is through it. That's true. That is true. I guess you could go over it, but yes, through it is the best way. (laughs) Through it is the best way. Definitely. And I love what you said earlier, because you said, instead of saying going through, you use the term growing through. And I feel like that is so, so the truth because, you know, we only get one life and it's a finite amount of time that we are not privy to the, the length. We're not privy to the time and date when we're going to no longer be here. And so it's almost like we have to have that mindset that we need to make these days count, right? Because we just don't know what the number is for us. And so that is also another part of facing fear because if you realize that and you know that you have to make this life meaningful, you have to enjoy this life and live it to the fullest so that you have no regrets, then you will look at facing fear very differently because you will actually welcome fear because you will know that that's the butterfly path that you described, right? That's it. You should, that's where you should go. Yeah. And so it's not about like, oh, I, I left all logic behind and I just followed my heart and took this big leap. No, there was a lot, of, a lot of logic that may have come along the path to making this decision. And ultimately, you use both your mind and your heart. And that's the most important thing. And that's what, you know, fear can be seen as, as a downfall or it can be seen as an opportunity. And I think over and over again, through this work that you're doing, through your tech company, through all of the different ventures that you have, you've shown that you have utilized fear as that opportunity to continue to move forward, to continue to grow. And it's the same thing with anything that we consider quote unquote terrible or not so great or wasn't what I expected. It's like even medicine. I I expected when I finished my residency, okay, I've arrived. This is it. I'm going to be making all this money and I get to do what I want. Ha 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 ha. And that's a joke, right? (laughs) Such a joke, such a joke. And I tried it that way. 
And then I realized that, oh, if I want to do this, I'm going to have to blaze a trail. And go. I don't want to. I'd rather, be, I'd rather be comfortable. I'd rather be pushy. But you know what? I finally said, I have to do this. If I'm going to continue to practice medicine, I have to do it on my trail. You hit a wall and you're just like, er, okay, I don't want to abandon this altogether. I've worked right. so hard yeah. to get here, but how can I do it in a way that fills me, that invigorates me, that not only makes the person experience more vitality, but me myself. It's like, and it holds me accountable to really like the utmost self care because I'm asking that of other people. I can't yeah. ask them to do what I don't do. That's the truth. Yeah. <laughs> that is the and truth. And done studies on it. They're like, you don't counsel on what you don't do. So whatever you do, that's what you counsel on. So I have to hold myself accountable. I am on a growth path, you know, and it's not about, oh, myself in comparison to Dr. Gregory. It's about me versus me so right. me back yeah. then versus me now yes and seeing that evolution and mm -hmm. seeing that growth and the courage because being an entrepreneur is probably one of the most courageous things i've ever done in my life yes <laughs> amen and, 100 100 100 <laughs> and it is not and i feel like on a daily basis. Oh yeah, that's but that's part of it. That's part of yeah. entrepreneurship. I mean, yeah. it's like feeling forward is just the norm. That's just normal. <laughs> but in medicine, you know, you hear fail and you're like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, God, devastation, God, yeah. Devastation, yeah. I gotta repeat, I gotta, what does that oh, mean yeah. about my identity? Yes, you know, yeah. I created this identity as the, the smart doctor and I failed? What do you mean, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But this is, it's just a totally more freeing, liberating way of seeing it. Oh my gosh. Yes. I, I it's like, um, yeah, I, I have to say that ever since I like start digging into entrepreneurship, like it has just opened up a whole other side of me and it is amazing. And I would say that that side of me being opened up and explored has allowed me to be a better doctor. Because, you know, in medicine, you really cannot think outside the box too much mm -hmm. because there is a standard of care. And if you are an outlier, outlier for the standard of care, then essentially that's fodder for you to be, you know, sued. Yes. That's the bottom line. And regardless of whether you, what you did was, was beneficial to the patient or not, it's, it's not a standard of care, right? So mm -hmm. people look at you like you have 10 heads. Yep. And so with entrepreneurship though, everybody expects you to think outside the box. <laughs> They're like, whatever, yeah, do it. You know, you could try things and you could fail at them. You could try something else, you know, and it is just amazing in that way. And it's like an awakening. I don't know if you experienced this, but like it totally was an awakening back those years ago when I started digging in, when I was working on my mind and my body. And I realized that I could help other people to do the same thing. I started a business doing that. And so like, uh, you know, that just opened my mind to it. And ever since I've been at it and it has been so fulfilling, absolutely a great way to, um, to complete the, the circle, I guess, yeah. and make my, you know, create another dimension of myself so that I don't feel as though if medicine were to go away tomorrow, that, which, you know, for many, it did go away in 2020. And, you know, it's still kind of sketchy, you know, still, and it's for, for many. And so um, I don't feel trapped by the handcuffs that medicine sometimes can put you in and it's freeing it's very freeing and it is an incredible incredible place to be so yeah no i i totally love entrepreneurship it's awesome yeah. <laughs> boy oh boy you know if but it's not easy it's not easy because it requires <laughs> you to grow yes and, and and put on your you know i had to put on my big girl pants and look okay well, what do I do now? Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. 
yeah, stumble, go this way, go in this. And, and also I'm realizing that it is not my innate nature to be a workaholic. You know, my entrepreneurship journey may be totally different than somebody else's. And I used to hear, oh, if you're an entrepreneur, you've got to work 100 hours a week. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. You've got to work so hard and, and burn the candle at both ends. And it never seemed appealing to me until I finally met one who was like, oh, no, I work five hours a day. And I was like, I want what you have. That's what I want for myself. And so they were like, well, just reverse engineer it. And I was like, well, what does that mean? Okay. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, yeah, take, this is how much I would like to be earning. These are how many hours I'd like to be working. This is what I want to design for my day and my life. This is what I want it to look like. And then work your way backwards from there. So I realized I'm not a volume person. I don't want to see, you know, 40 patients a day. I, I want to see eight. I want to maybe see 10 and go really deep. Yes. Yeah. Have the rich experience and, and personalized. And so I help people figure out where am I in that continuum? Am I somebody who gets like, oh, I feel so energized from seeing a zillion people and going, you know, hundred miles an hour and, and doing this, or am I somebody who likes to do things slower, you know? Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah. And so in knowing that and knowing yourself and tuning in, that's how you get out of burnout. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> that's the truth. That's so true. <laughs> What is your, what is your soul? What is your heart like tugging at you to do or to try or to experience and then, and then take it from there? Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. And then, so you have to let the audience know just in case they're not able to access the show notes right now, let them know how they can get in contact with you. Absolutely. So I'm on Instagram at D-R-L-E-R-O-Y-M-D. I'm on Facebook, Andre Leroy, or you could go to my website. It is www.drleroy.com. Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. We've had such a great conversation, Dr. Leroy, and we are at... (laughs) We're at that point in the show where we do our fill in the blanks. Are you ready? Okay. Awesome. So awesome. So the first one is if I am fearless, I will follow my heart. Love it. Love it. Mm. The next one is to me, fearless freedom means being able to tune into your inner wisdom and allowing yourself the experience of twists and turns along the way. Sweet, sweet. And then last but not least, my battle cry is. Tune in, tune in, tune in. (laughs) Awesome, 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 awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be on the show and for the tribe to get to hear your expertise. We greatly appreciate it. And we hope that you will continue to shine brightly and do the amazing things that you are currently doing for us as a specialty, as a craft, as a professional set, um, and every and beyond your patients beyond. So thank you. I just thank you for this opportunity. This you're incredible. You're an inspiration and keep rising. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Fearless Freedom with Dr. G. Again, I'm Dr. G. And if you like this episode, be sure to subscribe so that you can get notified of when the next episode is going to be. And also, I'll catch you next time. Have a great one. Be strong, be brave, and unleash your greatness.